We are joined now by Mike Zeller. He does the GIS up at USGS HVO. Good guy, been around since, uh, I mean, I met you in 2018 out on the lava float. And here we are today looking at another eruption. Yep. And I wanted to see about some of the efforts that you had in you know, creating this map and some of the difficulties in those early days of the, the eruption. Unlike 2018, where it was kind of like a, like a slow start with like small fissures within like the Leimani subdivision, uh, and then it later progressed to like its highest levels of activity a few weeks in. Mm -hmm. Mount Aloha is kind of the reverse, where it starts with super high effusion rates and like the biggest expansion of flows is right at the beginning of the eruption. So I was I was lucky enough to get to see it that first morning, but I seeing it out the window of the helicopter, I was like, oh man, this is a big area, and like it's going to be very difficult to map all this. And we ultimately ended up relying heavily on our partners at the, the USGS National Civil Application Center, who get to look at classified military satellite imagery, and they were able to do a lot of the mapping of, of the stuff that erupted within the caldera and in just southwest of the caldera because. That, that was an area that, like, it was, it was done erupting by the time we got up there in the helicopter, um, and it was just such a huge area that it, was, it wasn't really going to be possible for us to use our traditional methods to map it. And so we kind of focused our efforts on tracking the flow front, and we had a variety of methods for doing that, including mapping it, mapping lines from the helicopter, shooting distances from using a laser rangefinder from Saddle Road. Um, also, just doing our, our normal thermal mapping that we've used extensively for years at Kilauea. Um, th those methods were a little, or a little bit better geared to an isolated area of greatest interest, such as such as the flow front that approached Saddle Road. One of the things that we saw as this was the, the progression. Eventually, you were able to get it so the entire map is filled out. Right, and you're uh, updating it multiple times a day. How long are you out there to, you know, make these measurements? You know, it, it takes time to get the crews in place, and it takes time to get the helicopter crew up there. But the 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 app that we were using actually allowed the helicopter crew, if they, if they were fly, able to fly close enough to the flow front to map it from the helicopter, they were able to push the update back to us in the office in real time. Oh, wow. And so we didn't have to wait for them to like land and 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 you know log onto a computer and. and but still, there's some there's some distillation that, that takes place. We need to we need to connect the dots because often we would get like incomplete data, and we would we would take a look at the webcam and see based on the webcam where like the edge of the flow was to like fill the gap in the data that we had. So that's 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 why there's still there's still some steps toward to get it to the condition that we can put it out to the public. But we were actually we were able to get like a quick look at like just the raw distance to Saddle Road, which was the most important thing during this eruption, right. relatively quickly based on some of these methods that we're using. One of the issues if you're doing this as a layman, right, the issue with Mauna Loa is it's so big and everything looks the same, right? It's hard to get a point of reference when you're looking at like, where am I on this flow? Am I here or am I here or am I a little bit down? But for you guys, everything is digitized. It's all fed in the data stream, so it doesn't matter. Well, we, we have, I, I, I've built some maps in, in the ArcGIS collector map interface that our people can use and reference while they're out in the field. Mm -hmm. And that got extensive use during this eruption that we were able to plot the fissure lines from the helicopter that day the eruption started because I was, I was like looking out the window of the helicopter and seeing like, oh, you know, it's just at the end of this cinder cone that I can see on this map. And I put one end of the fissure there and put the other end down rift several hundred meters because I can see the end of it near right. this other cinder cone down there. So that's... that's so you're, you're, you're doing that, that, the initial fissure placements at least, that's still... Uh, a little bit of uh, manual uh, yes, yeah. process. And that. ultimately, ultimately, to get all of this is manual because even for those people who are using the satellite images, they still have to click on the boundaries. True. The, our, the technology has not developed to the point that we can like just like take an aerial image and like extract the new lava flow from it automatically. Right. The colors blend a little bit too much at the edges. Even even thermal images. Their, the gradients fall off right at the edge of the channel. It doesn't fall off at the edge of the flow where right, the lava right, is. Right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. even even that is a bit of a challenge. And so there's still a lot of manual digitizing when even when we get like an automatic satellite image pushed to us. Okay. If we were to put take this Fisher three and we were to put it on the southwest rift zone at roughly the same elevation, mm -hmm. does it reach the ocean or not? A problem if it, if it goes to the west side, right. there's a good chance that it does because the slopes are steep and 
most of the flows that we have seen go in that direction have gotten the whole way down the flank to the ocean. If it goes to the east, which is a little bit rarer, the, the, the only historical example I know of that, that's happened was one of the 1950 lobes went to the east. It's a little bit slower and it, it, it stopped in the Karu Forest Reserve. It didn't even, it didn't even make it to the sugarcane fields. So because of, because of those steep slopes on the west side of the southwest surf zone, there is a good chance that yeah, it probably would have, would have reached the ocean. So um, in terms of volume calculations for this, was it easier to, to try and get volume off of this flow versus something like 2018 where most of it's getting deposited on the ocean? E easier because we can see all of it, yes, but it's such a huge area and there's a lot of noise in the data and also areas where the flow is like relatively thin are like difficult to model and it's like hard exactly to like like dis discern the difference between the new surface and the old surface when you're looking at like just a digital elevation model. There's a there are still challenges but it certainly helps compared to 2018 for example that none of it was lost in the ocean. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So maybe we just conclude with a few basic stats mm -hmm. on this thing. How much lava did this, uh, or by, what was the covered area of this uh, flow? Total covered area during this eruption was 16 and a half square miles. The total length of the Fissure 3 flow, the main one that threatened Saddle Road, was 12.1 was miles. Um, and um, not on this map, but we've been working a lot to try to better constrain the volume that came out, um, because that's important for understanding, you know, geophysically how much how much lava came out of the volcano's summit magma reservoir. And there's a range of values, and we're, we're still working to get better data sets to constrain that better. But we know it was it was at least 140 million cubic meters, which is coincidentally yeah. almost exactly yeah. the same that's in the crater at Halemaumau right, right. right now. So, so you can imagine that that entire pit filled with lava down there at, in the Kilauea caldera. About that same amount of lava was erupted on Mount Aloha's summit in Rift Zones. Well, hey, I appreciate your time. Yeah, Mike. it's good to see you again, Dean. Yeah, as yeah. Well.